This story is sort of a planned luck story. It's a story where two people who have never met each other get together overnight over an idea and work sort of in their own sort of worlds to make it real. And, and this is sort of the story of how that happened. Some people talk about wanting to put a ding in the universe. In my case, it was sort of the other way around. The universe put a ding in me. And what do I mean by that? Here's a place, Haiti, where the universe puts a lot of dings in just about everybody on that island. I guess the story goes back to the night before my calculus final. I'm studying, and my friend comes in and says, hey, you got to go see Steel Pulse. Let's go. So we go to see Steel Pulse, this reggae band, and I forget about my calculus final. 20 years later, and this is again about connections between weird things that aren't normally related, but they all end up being related. 20 years later, I'm working on a project with Steel Pulse, Partners in Health in Haiti, and an organization called the Solar Electric Light Fund. And they're trying to solar electrify these uh, clinics that are out there in the middle of nowhere. And while I was working on that project, I saw these houses where poor people would basically, it would rain, the mud would just, the floor would turn to mud, the guys would uh, get sick, 12 people in a house that size. And so I started thinking, you know, in this day and age, why can't we do something better than this? Surely we can do something. And this is an example of a, you know, a $300 house that's 100 years old. That house is 100 years old. It's in Florida in about the same climate conditions as Haiti. So again, I started thinking about, okay, what can we do? And then this was kind of interesting. Uh, th this is... <laughs> Uh, I looked at that house as well. That's, that's sort of the $3, the three billion dollar house. Uh, and so the question is, why can't we solve this problem? What's, the, what's holding us back? Uh, so let me go over sort of the, the process. We started off with an idea, then, and, and again, we put that idea, uh, built a community, people started getting attracted to this idea from all over the world. Uh, in fact, people started sending in their designs, so we had a design challenge, and then we had a prototyping workshop, and now we're actually in the final phase of doing some real experiments in the field. And by we, I don't mean me, because I'm ignorant, or anyone, I mean the companies and the individuals that have been inspired to join us and do this as part of this uh, project. And just so you know, we don't have a $300 house. The idea is to force people to think and rethink what it means to build a very, very low-cost house. We have an $800 house, we have a $1,200 house, we have a $1,500 house, we have a $2,000 house. Different people, different companies. So let's talk about this. The idea was, can we just build something that keeps people safe? So it's almost like if you go to Home Depot in the United States, you have these garden sheds. And in England, they have these garden sheds that are about 360 pounds or about $600, you can buy these garden sheds, which are a lot better than those houses that you saw in Haiti. Uh, and so this was the sketch that, that we put together with a tablet PC. At that time, we had no idea that you would have a $30 tablet like we have now in, in India. But this was about two years ago when we sketched this. Can you build a house where people actually you know, feel safe, Get it. So the house becomes a, sort of a delivery mechanism, not just a place to live. It becomes a delivery mechanism for safety, for basically getting your water, all the things that you need. It's a health delivery system, if you think about it this way. Because without a house, pretty much you're out of luck. You're not going to be healthy. You're not going to be able to go to school. You're not going to be able to work. Everything gets a lot harder. Of course, we're all living in nice houses. So you know, in, some, in, in some ways, you can say, what do we really know about the poor? Well, let me start telling you about how all of a sudden, when we posted that blog post in the Harvard Business Review, we got this swell of interest. The phone started ringing. People started calling, hey, we want to help. What can we do? We take up your challenge. And so the question then is, OK, how do you trust people who you've never met before coming in from all over the place? And that's sort of how we started building a community, almost by trusting people that we had no clue who they were. They came up to us from nowhere. Some of them turned out to be weasels. And some of them were real nice people who really cared. So, you know, some of them were, you know, leading a meaningful life. Uh, so let me tell you a little story about uh, building a community. So VG and I started off, VG is, uh, I went to Ted Turner, but his assistant wouldn't let me pass the doors. 
So I went to the, the next best guy, who was a client of mine, Vijay Govindarajan, who's a professor at Dartmouth. And I've never met this guy in my life, although we've worked together. He's a client of mine from way back, but I, you know, we've never met in person. So I asked him, hey, dude, would you like to help me with this idea? And he said, yes, I've actually been thinking about this problem myself, and let's, let's go for it. So once we did that initial blog article, we got a whole bunch of experts, corporate, you know, NGO, all kinds of designers to start talking about the same subject. And from there, we sort of built our, sent a few students to, from Dartmouth to India, started, uh, that's Ophelia Dahl from Partners in Health, David Hines from Steel Pulse, the band I told you about, you know, you know. and all these people sort of, sort of started crawling out of the woodwork. The result was we ended up with a design challenge where a German company came to us from nowhere and said, hey, we'd like to help you with your design challenge, post your designs online, and then uh, all of a sudden a sponsor appeared and said, we'd like to fund all of that. Did we ask for any of this? No, it just all sort of started happening. And as it happened, we just said, okay, go for it. And The Economist, who's the sponsor of this thing here today, also wrote an article about us, so that was timely. Uh, but here's the challenge, right? How do you get all the designers in the world to focus on a new audience, right? Because they've been designing people, and if you look at it, that's the market basically designs stuff for the top 10% in India or anywhere else, and especially the top 10% in poor countries. So how do we flip that? And that was sort of the challenge of this uh, contest. So we had this contest. At 12 o'clock midnight, on the end of the contest, we got our last entry to make it 300 entries for the $300 house. We then had a panel of judges select the winners, and uh, we had a prototyping workshop, which I told you happened at Dartmouth. And Jim Kim at that point said, hey, look, you're now in this thing, and uh, a gazillion reasons are going to happen, and people are going to tell you you can't do this thing, but you have to believe that it is doable. And that sort of is part of this thing. It's you just have to go, you know what? People are telling you it can't be done, but let's just see what we can do and keep going. So while we haven't reached perhaps $300, we have you know, at least focused an effort on building products and services for the poorest uh, of the poor. So now we'll talk about the pilot projects. Um, here's Harvey Lacey, a, a guy who's sort of this redneck guy from Texas who went to Haiti and started building, taught the women there to actually build their own houses using recycled materials and this technique that he has called Ubuntu blocks, where you build your own blocks. So he went into the ghetto, they told him you're gonna be killed, six, six weeks later he comes out with all these houses that have been built in, in, in the ghetto. He's an amazing character. So you see these, the personality of these meaningful people who are making a difference. Here's a guy named Patrick Reynolds who basically decided not only was he going to build the house, so instead of designing the house, he actually went and built it. Then he said, well, that's not enough. We've got to have electricity, so he's messing with his solar panel thing. He's got a water purification thing, and he says we should put all of this in a can so we can just ship it anywhere and, and have all these systems ready sort of to help the entire village. So it, that's his concept. And then what about India? We had a little field survey that talked about well, how does a regular person spend their life the different times of the day? So this survey actually helped us by a company called Three-Headed Lion. They basically said, we'll go to the 15 poorest villages we can find and get you back some data. And so we got some serious data telling us exactly what the people wanted. Using that data, we have an example of World House in Chennai, where they, they've built a house, uh, which they're, they're testing out with a family. And then this is the... I think the biggest story here is, you know how some people are saying that corporate guys won't get involved or don't want to touch this kind of stuff? Well, we had a group of corporate guys from Mahindra and Mahindra who basically donated their time, got together on a volunteer basis, no one told them to do it, submitted a design for the contest, won the contest, then Mahindra brought all these different branches of their company together after that, and here's an example in Vihar where they planned a whole village uh, that was recovering from a flood. The next CSR, the, the next corporate social responsibility sort of strategy should be to actually solve problems instead of throwing money and doing PR, right? So this is an example of that. And this is what they're doing in Pondicherry, a giant development for the tsunami victims. So it's actually a very you know, hardening thing to see that it's not just a house, it's a village, it's not just a village, it's a life. And so what can you do 
I'm asking you to give a small portion of your time to something beyond yourself. So I'm asking you, if you can, to be, because no one here is actually, or very few people here are, are going to be sannyasis in their lives. So what I'm asking is, do it a part-time. You know, just give a little bit of your time to something greater than yourself, that you're not worried about sort of a profit motive. And businesses, what can businesses do? By focusing, focusing on these new markets, on the poor, they're going to create products and services and build capabilities that they didn't know they had. And these very capabilities are going to help them compete in the next world, in the, next, in the future. Uh, I'll end with this. It says, what can India teach the world? Well, India has taught the world a lot of things. And I want to say one of the things that we need, and we, I really feel like India has taught the world, is the idea of inclusivity, that we are sort of all knitted together, and that the opposite of inclusivity is not exclusivity, but it's apartheid. And we don't want that. So let's, let's go forward. Join us. Thank you.